the thesis uh, of this book is very simple, basically, that the, the Mediterranean was the inland sea of the classical world. I think we can probably all agree with that. And that if you do agree, then it's a hop, skip and a jump to saying that the Atlantic is the inland sea of the modern world, of today's world. And I argued that in an earlier book. And if you agree with that thesis, then it's reasonable to say that the Pacific Ocean is the inland sea of tomorrow's world. And that, that's the basic, the, the overarching principle behind the book. But the big problem with the Pacific is its size. It's so enormous. I mean, if you stand in Panama, you can look due west without any land at all for 10,600 miles, which is what, four United States. If you stand up in the Bering Strait and look south towards Cape Horn, it's 9,600 miles, 64 million square miles. And how do you impose some kind of a structure on that ocean to, um, to make it readable? Well, I'm a great believer in, in when you write on a fairly large non-fiction subject that there are three components which are important. The, first, the most important thing when you're writing a book is the idea. You've got to have a good idea. But the second most important thing, it's beguiling to think it's, the, it's good writing. But in fact, I think that's not, it is nice if the book is well written, obviously, but it's not the second most important thing. The second most important thing I've always thought is the structure. You've got to find a, a structure, a logical structure, because you can write lyrically about a wonderful idea, but if the structure's all wrong, uh, the reader will just go to sleep and it won't, uh, won't captivate him or her. So I had to find, find a structure for the, for these books. The Atlantic, relatively easy. I, uh, I won't go into it in any detail, but the structure I imposed on that was uh, taken from the Seven Ages of Man of Shakespeare. So um, I looked at the ocean in its infancy and then as a school child and a lover, a soldier, a justice, an old man and the return to childhood. And that seemed to work all right. And then the immediate successor to this was a book about the making of, of the United States. And I, for that, I used the five key elements in Chinese philosophy, wood, earth, water, fire, and metal, and, and that, that seemed to work quite well. But the Pacific, it really foxed me, because as I say, it's so enormous, has all these billions of people, every imaginable creed and color and ethnic group. It, it was um, astonishingly difficult. But guided by this idea that it was the ocean of tomorrow, not the ocean of today and yesterday, I thought at least I'd choose a starting point which was relatively close to the modern day. And what I would do was to discard all the people that we vaguely remember from our school days as having some association with the Pacific. When I say the Pacific, I mean the recorded history of the Pacific. So that essentially means ever since the Europeans discovered it, which was in the 16th century, with Balboa standing on a peak in Darien and seeing it and then wading down into it and taking it for Spain, which is a pretty impertinent thing to do, but that's what he did in 1521. And um, I decided to discard him. And I might say that Balboa uh, is a bit of a, an oddity anyway, because um, if you remember Keats's poem on first looking in Chapman's Homer, uh, he talks about um, stout Cortez standing high on a peak in Darien and seeing the Pacific. Uh, he sh Keats wrote that very late one night, apparently, and showed it to his mentor the following morning. And his mentor said, well, you got it wrong, Keats. It wasn't Cortez that discovered the Pacific, it was Balboa. And he said, yes, I, I knew that, but stout Balboa has four syllables and doesn't scan. So do you think anyone will know if we keep it as Cortez, and he kept his, and legions of British school children, certainly, and probably American school children, if they read poetry, have labored under the misapprehension that Cortez had, he had nothing to do with it at all. But I think most people agree with the next famous person, and that's Magellan, who in 1529 nosed out uh, of, um, the Straits of Magellan into the Pacific on what happened to be a calm and beautiful blue day in 1529, and called it Mare Pacifico, because it was a Pacific Ocean. But those people, Balboa, Magellan, Cortez, to the extent he played any role at all, people like Captain Cook, Dampier, all the great 19th century, 18th century explorers of the Pacific, I decided to take those as a given. You know, we, let's forget about them. Let's, um, <laughs> because that's not what the book's about. So I wanted a more up-to-date moment to begin the story. And I decided, well, it could have been 
the 2nd of September 1945, which is the date that we, uh, the Japanese surrendered um, on the deck of the Missouri and Tokyo Bay, uh, the, bringing World War II to an end. That was a beguiling date. Or the 10th of um, October 1949, which is a true hinge point of history, which was the founding of the People's Republic of China. But in the end, I came up with another date, which has a sort of beautiful and very pacific logic to it. And that was the 1st of January 1950. And I should explain how that date came about. It's all to do with the dating system that we use in the world today. I mean, this, I think we all agree, is 2015, Anno Domini, the year of the Lord, 2015. And the Romans, if I've got it right, invaded Britain in 55 BC, before Christ. But that convention, BC and AD, is, you know, it's all right if you're Christian, but to an awful lot of people in the world who aren't Christian, it's either irrelevant or offensive or both. And so about 30 or 40 years ago, a new dating convention was contrived um, using the initials BCE. We talk about events having happened BCE, which stands either if you have a lingering affection for Christianity before Christian era, or if you're entirely secularly minded, it's before common era. And that is what most people do these days, most historians anyway, but not the scientific community. The scientific community has no truck with that, and instead came up at about the same time, about 30 years ago, with another convention, which was BP, and that's for mainly sort of long-range things in the past. You talk about the Wisconsin Ice Age, for instance, as having occurred 10,000 years BP. And BP, I'm sure you all know, stands for before present. But that nonetheless prompts the question of when is present. <laughs> and it has actually been decided, and it's been decided by a, cr a crew of uh, radio chemists at the University of Queen's University in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, and it's, that's all to do, and, and here I'm going to venture briefly into some boring technicalities, it's all to do with carbon dating. Because... As you may all remember, carbon dating is based on a very simple principle, that in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide that we breathe um, contains carbon, but in two forms, the stable isotope carbon-12 and the unstable isotope carbon-14, which, if you remember, decays, has a half-life of 7,530 years. So if you've got a fistful of carbon-14 in 7,530 years, you'll have half of it, and then another 7,000, you have half of what remains. So the ratio between those two isotopes is fixed, or has been fixed for a very long time. It's about one trillion atoms of carbon-12 to one of carbon-14. And so what happens if a tree drops down and dies and stops absorbing carbon dioxide? the carbon ratio in it will change because the carbon-14, it's, it's not going to absorb any more carbon-12, that remains the same, but the carbon-14 gets less and less and less. And so you can work out by comparing what's left with what we know the ratio is in the atmosphere, we know when that tree died. And that's the principle, the basis of carbon dating. However, that was all fine and dandy until 1950. But in 1950, we started testing atomic weapons. And one of the fission products, and indeed fusion products, of uh, both fission, uh, you know, atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs is carbon-14. And an immense amount was pumped up into the atmosphere in the 1950s and early 1960s, totally distorting that sort of the baseline. And so the radiochemists went crazy and they had to each year to get the dating accurate. They had to introduce algorithms and algorithms got more and more complicated as the years went on and everyone got really exasperated and a lot of people left carbon dating and said, you know, we'll use other things, rubidium, strontium or whatever. But the bottom line to all this is that before 1950, putting it crudely, the world was pure and after 1950, the world became impure. And so that was chosen as the index year for present. And it's also perfect for me because all the impurities, or nearly all the impurities, came about a result of, as a result of atomic testing in the Pacific Ocean. So it had a sort of poetic tone to it. So I chose that as the beginning point of the story. And then, and I'll explain this a little bit later, the end point 
is the 14th of May 2014. And as I say, I'll, t I'll tell you why that date in a few moments. So I've got 64 years to play with. That's the story that I want to tell. And what I decided to do, because I didn't want to do the Seven Ages of Man, I didn't want to do the Chinese elements, I would look at the ocean, try and find all the events that I thought were of any significance that occurred during those 64 years. And so I combed newspaper articles and scientific papers and films and all sorts of things and came up with about 300 events that seemed to be significant. And then I had this sort of miserable time of pairing them away to 10, just discarding, in other words, about 290 of them and choosing the 10 most significant events that seemed to me to betoken a trend in the Pacific such that if you followed the trend through in each of these essays, you would at the end of the day get an impression of what the Pacific is like today and what it's likely to be like in the future. So the 10 that I chose, which are the basis of the 10 central chapters of the book, are arranged in chronological order. And do not worry, I'm not going to go through all 10 of them, but I'll just give you the first three to give you an indication of the kind of thing that I had in mind. So we begin on the 1st of January 1950, and as luck would have it, the first event that I chose, and which seemed to have this significance, was on the 4th of January 1950, which was when President Truman stood up before the Joint uh, Houses of Congress and gave his State of the Union message for that year, in which he announced two important things. Firstly, that the United States would begin testing a new kind of weapon, which the scientists in Chicago mainly told him it was possible to create, and that was a thermonuclear weapon, a fusion bomb. They had already tested and dropped, you know, with disastrous effect, two fission bombs, but these were relatively small. Fusion bombs could be limitless in their size. They could be truly gigantic. So they figured that they knew how to do this, and so they would try and make one, and uh, they would test them, and that was the second and important thing he said, they would test them in the Pacific, because all the real estate that America now had as a result of the, uh, the victory over the, the Japanese, who had a great deal of real estate in the Pacific. So I devote a lot of time in this first chapter in talking about the what I call the Great Thermonuclear Sea, because that in a way defines the early history. And it's that, unfortunately, an awful lot of what this book is about is about the interference in the Pacific of Western people, of generally white people, Europeans or Americans, and to generally pretty disastrous effect. Uh, I mean, to give you, and also it's done so cynically and cruelly, uh, to give you one example from when they tested the weapons, uh, they decided to, to do it in, in the Marshall Islands and specifically in two atolls, one called Inuitok, but the one we all know of is Bikini. And, uh, you know, the Bikinians, entirely innocent, peaceful people who, not very many of them, a couple of hundred, living on this big atoll with a wonderful lagoon and palm trees and all this sort of stuff, and living a life of fishing and mending their nets and the, using their outrigger canoes and harvesting coconuts and growing a few vegetables, never doing any harm to anybody, except that they had been interfered with briefly and to relatively disastrous effect in the late 19th century by the biggest interferers of all, who were the missionaries. Missionaries found out, mainly from the United States, and came to a place like Bikini and saw these naked people, and that was really offensive to the missionaries, and said, first you've got to dress. And so they made them wear these ghastly, what they call Mother Hubbard, sort of moo-moo dresses. And then you've got to learn the Bible, because that is, you know, what, what we're all about. And so these people said, okay, well, you're obviously you know, wise people, so we'll learn the Bible. And then this was used... 50 years later, to disastrous effect, because when America decided, and if I say America, I'm not being critical of it, because I am an American now, so I, I'm one of you guys, I'm not pointing out your, your folly in any way. Um, when we decided to, to test these weapons on bikini, which was ideal in all sorts of ways for testing, um, we decided to use their Christianity as a vehicle for getting them to agree to do it. And the way we did it was, and you can see there's an amazing YouTube film which shows a young, you know, clean-shaven, fresh-from-college American uh, naval officer 
on Bikini Island in Bikini Atoll with a group of nearly all the islanders, I should think, sitting around him cross-legged in the background, the palm trees and the beach and the surf beating against the, the coral and so forth. It looks absolutely idyllic. And he's saying to them, do you remember from your Bible that God gave a signal to the Israelites to leave the Holy Land by erecting a pillar of fire. That was the signal. Well, we now can create a pillar of fire. We've made these new devices which create pillars of fire. And we're going to make a pillar of fire here. We want you to accept this as a signal which you should leave your land and let us create pillars of fire and test these weapons for the good of all mankind and it's the work of God. And they said, yeah, if you say so, okay, um, we remember Exodus, so yes, okay, we'll go. And so they went, and they were exiled to a miserable little island called Kili, about 800 miles south of Bikini, which didn't have a lagoon, didn't have any palm trees, they weren't able to launch their, their boats from there. And they've been there ever since, while the United States tested these gigantic weapons, completely devastated the island. They came back briefly in the 70s because President Johnson thought they ought to be allowed to, but it turns out still to be totally irradiated. And the, the sad and savage irony for these people is that just two weeks ago, the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands, who, who knew that the Marshall Islands had a foreign minister, but they do, was in London last week pleading that Britain takes in these people. And this is now, what, 60, 70 years since they were exiled, because the island to which they were exiled, Kili, is now flooding because of the rising sea levels of the Pacific Ocean. So these poor innocent people, thanks to the interference of us in the West, have had their homes destroyed, their island irradiated, and sent to a place that they don't like, and now they've got to leave that because their homes are being flooded. So that's the kind of misery that unfortunately tends to pop up all over this book. But it's not an entirely miserable book. And chapter two, and as I say, I'm not going to do them all, but I, the first three will give you an indication that it's not all gloom and doom. Chapter two begins with um, a small event that happened in, of all places, Edmonton, Alberta. I don't know, I hope none of you are, are from Edmonton, because I was there three weeks ago, and it is the most dismal city on earth. <laughs> uh, it really, really is. And it was, you know, winter was approaching, it's cold, it's dark, all the buildings are built in the 1970s, and it's, it's, oh, it's a horrible place. But anyway, it plays an interesting role in the story of the Pacific, because on Jasper Avenue in Edmonton, on August the 8th, 1955, you see each chapter is four or five years later on, there appeared in an electronics shop there, and also one in Winnipeg and one in Vancouver, a small radio set. It would fit in your shirt pocket. It was called the TR-55. The interesting thing about this is that up to that moment, a radio set had been a piece of furniture. It's a thing that sat in the corner of the living room. It was covered with walnut veneer. You put an aspidistra on top of it. You turned it on. It warmed up. It hummed. And you tuned in your station. But this thing that the people of Edmonton were being encouraged to buy for, I think, thirty-nine ninety-five or something, you could listen to all the music and sports and theater or whatever you wanted to. And you could take it out into the garden. You could take it to bed with you. You could take it to school. You could take it to the swimming pool pool, the beach, well not there are any beaches in Edmonton, but nonetheless it was it transformed the way you listened to radio. It became a personal device and no longer a piece of furniture. And it was made in Japan and around the tuning dial at the top it had the word Totsko, which is Tokyo Telecommunications Company, and underneath in tiny little letters was the acronym, the new word, Sony. It was the first ever device made by Sony and it was the first ever transistor radio in the world. And it was invented by this extraordinary man. I mean, if we think of Sony, you tend to think of that white-haired sort of silver fox of a man, Akio Morita. But the man that really made Sony a, a, a world force, in, at least in engineering, was this man called Masaru Ibuka, who was an engineer, a horny-handed son of toil from the working class parts of Tokyo, dirt under his fingernails. Coke bottle spectacles, and had these fascinations with things like model railway trains and helium balloons and things, and he invented things. So he invented this transistor radio. He went on to invent, if you remember, 
the Walkman, you remember, a device that, a tape recorder that didn't record, which was something thought was a heresy. He went on to introduce the, tr or make the Trinitron television tube. He went and made the Betamax recorder. I mean, he was an astonishing guy. So these first radios appeared in Edmonton and they sold out. And then about a month later, 4,000 of them came here to New York. And they were put in a warehouse, the Delmonico warehouse in Queens. And, and I often think this might have been a publicity stunt arranged by Sony. They were stolen. And there was this story, it was in November 1955, page 17 of the first section of the New York Times. Um, heist in Queens, radios stolen. And the thing about the theft was that the, this was a warehouse full of electronic goods, but the only things that the burglars took were these new Sony radios, which, you know, were two inches by three inches and weighed 11 ounces or something. And everyone read the details that they'd never heard of Sony. And they all thought, well, if it's good enough for the burglars, it's good enough for us. And they ordered these things by the thousands. And as it happened, by entire coincidence, in Atlantic City, New Jersey, at about almost exactly the same time, there was invented the shipping container. And the story of the shipping container is completely different, and it's actually in the Atlantic book. But it was invented, and the Japanese realized that if huge numbers of these boxes of radios were going to be sold, sent to an America that was now eagerly interested in them because of the burglary, um, they would use shipping containers to bring them in. And so a trade pattern began within months a trade pattern which has dominated the Pacific ever since, which is of container ships leaving ports like Yokohama, bound for Vancouver and Seattle and Long Beach and Oakland, bringing these extraordinary inventions that the American market largely wanted uh, in an easterly direction across the Pacific. And other Japanese firms, of course, uh, join, uh, competed, and Nikon and Panasonic and all the others. And then slowly the Japanese inventive zeal began to wane and it was picked up by Korea, so ports like Pusan would send stuff from Samsung, and then the Chinese ports, of course, when the, I think of the container ports in the world, the seven biggest now are on the East Chinese coast. But ev whenever you see, whenever you stand on the Golden Gate Bridge and see one of these enormous evergreen container ships sweeping in under the bridge towards Oakland and the, the ports there, laden with goods, it began with that one tiny little radio set, the TR-55 transistor radio for sale in Jasper Avenue in Edmonton, Alberta. So that's a fairly cheerful chapter, yeah. as is the third. And then, as I say, I'm going to leave the chapters and just tell you about a couple of things I discovered. The third chapter is about a movie that opened, and remember we're moving forward, so this was on April the 23rd, 1959, Shakespeare's birthday, as it happens, I've just realized. April the 23rd, 1959, a movie was opened in Long Island, in, in the, I think in the Hamptons actually, but in other places in, in closer to, to the city. Columbia Pictures didn't have the confidence in this rather slight film, very oversaturated, slightly sexy, slightly erotic story. Um, to release it in, in the big cities. They, so they released it, generally speaking, in the suburbs. But the then New York Times critic, film critic, heard about it and went to see it and loved it and wrote a lyric, I mean, as lyrically as the New York Times would write in the 1950s, piece saying, this is the film to see this year in the summer. It's a transport of delight. And it was the film which many of you possibly may remember, and that was the film Gidget about this 14, 15 year old girl called Kathy Kona, who on the beach in Malibu, where all the women, all beautiful, but wearing the most extraordinary bathing costumes, they had no navels in those days, of course, so they went high up on the waist, and learned surfing, and showed that she, a little slip of a young lady, could actually surf along with the big boys. And this enabled me to sort of expatiate at length on the history of surfing, which is on at one level, the Pacific's gift to playtime. I mean, it's, it can be seen entirely trivially, but it is a, rather more than that. It began in Tahiti. It was called wave riding, standing up on a plank and going about on the top of waves uh, about a thousand years ago. But it spread slowly, inexorably, 
to Hawaii and that's where it really took off and the, the Hawaii is a very structured society with a very rigid class system and so the, the big fat Hawaiian aristocracy fat because they eat this stuff called poi you know, pounded taro root and so they're enormous like, sort of like sumo wrestlers um, they surfed on the best surfing breaks using boards which were 21 22 feet long I mean huge things I dare say this is not a 22 foot ceiling so gigantic and very very heavy boards and the the younger people I mean the children had these little boards called uh, uh, pipo which were much more manageable and th but the trouble is the missionaries once again because of course the Hawaiians surfed without any clothes on and the missionaries arrived and they were shocked, shocked, particularly the lady missionaries or the wives of the missionaries. And so they said to the Hawaiians, I'm sorry, you've, uh, and it, I, when you think of it, I mean, a 400 pound Hawaiian prince naked on a surfboard would be a somewhat intimidating sight, I would have thought. <laughs> so um, it might put you off your complex or something. But anyway, um, they said, you have a choice. Either you wear moo-moos to surf in, or you just simply stop this barbaric ha habit. And they said, well, we're not going to wear clothes when we surf. Of course, we'll stop surfing. And they did. And no one surfed at all in the early part of the 19th century, except the children. And that proved a, a, a moment of delight for Jack London, because Jack London in 1907 came to Hawaii. He was traveling around the world in that schooner, the Snark, and he fetched up in Honolulu and he was swimming one day in off Waikiki, which was then just a little village, with his wife. And suddenly he was overtaken by a crowd of these adorable little children, all racing about on the waves on these little surfboards. And he thought, my God, this is, the, this is such fun. I want to learn how to do it. And so he managed to persuade, I mean, he was a big, lumbering, white, clumsy guy. But he thought initially that this was something only the native peoples could do, but he found that he became adept at it. And when he finally got up on the top of a wave and managed to sweep into the beach without falling off and at great speed, he was tr transported. It was utter ecstasy. And he wrote this amazing essay uh, called Surfing the King of Sports for the Women's Home Companion of October 1907. And it caused a sensation over here. It was syndicated in the Pall Mall Gazette in London and then in a magazine in Australia. And all of a sudden surfing became a sport which beaches were uh, engineered as it were for the sport but all around the Pacific and around the Pacific only so Huntington Beach and Redondo Beach and Malibu in California and Bondi and places like that in Australia and so that's where it remained for most of the early part of the 20th century until Gidget and then Gidget suddenly it, people on the advice of the New York Times guy and maybe for other reasons went to see Sandra D doing exactly and they loved it they just adored it and so surfing then began to take off and it's now what a 13 billion dollar industry and is you know, worldwide Portugal Ireland it's all over the place um, but it also does more than it's more than just playtime and it's actually infected um, management techniques there isn't much about management in this book I'm sure you'll be relieved to know but um, there was a man called Yvon Chouinard who was a great climber and athlete who started the company called Patagonia making climbing clothes and running shorts and things like that and um, he was a keen surfer so he decided to put his first factories on the Pacific Coast Highway and to say to his workers look when the surf's up go surfing and um, I know when you come back you'll be happy you'll think I'm a great employer work as long as you like in the evening go home and if it's surfing in the time in the morning go surfing and so the idea of flexi time effectively was born and so this is a management technique which is now used all over particularly in California with Google and uh, you know, Facebook and all these other companies largely as a basis of Schwinard and his love for surfing which in his view should be more important than anything else in, in, in life, and which is a perfectly reasonable thing to think, I think. <laughs> but from my point of view, there's been a wonderful coda to all of this, which is about um, three weeks ago, when I was on the middle of this very long tour, I had an email from Gidget. She's, Kathy Kona is now Kathy Zimmerman. She's 72 years old. She lives in Malibu. She surfs every day. And two days a week, she works in a bookstore. <laughs> 
and she read this relevant chapter in the book and tracked me down and wrote to me and the bottom line is that I'm actually going to be in Southern California again in, uh, in early December the 7th I think and we're having lunch oh, so yeah. whatever happens to this book I really don't care I'm going to have I'm going to have have lunch with Gidget <laughs> So the chapters go on, and there's a chapter on North Korea, a chapter on withdrawal of empire, of course, on the environment, a chapter on weather, because the Pacific is the big weather generator for the world, and for the sort of serious-minded, there's a big fat chapter on the relations with, between America and China, which is obviously very much in the news with the destroyers, the American destroyers, sailing close to these new islands that have been built in the South China Sea. So what I want to do, and I sort of think, obviously keep an eye on the clock, um, is pick out three, maybe two, because I tend to be rather long-winded, as you know, um, episodes which I learned, because, uh, the, as I probably mentioned before, one of the wonderful things about doing a book like this is that I learn so much as I'm going along. And the first thing is, goes back to this whole business of, of nuclear testing, um, something I didn't know. Um, and it just is a wonderful illustration of the callousness with which we Westerners have behaved towards these people. It involves a man, and I, he's a villain in my view, and I love identifying villains. He's called Alvin Graves, and he was a nuclear physicist. And he was working in Los Alamos on the early designs of the bombs when he was involved in a terrible accident. And you may have seen this because it figures a dramatized version of it is in a, a film called Fat Man and Little Boy, I think. What was happening, there was an experiment being conducted by a man from Bro Brooklyn called Louis Slotin, who was a very clever physicist. And they had two hemispheres of plutonium, finely machined, uh, flat surfaces and they would if you put them together they would be a supercritical mass and the whole thing would explode so what they were doing was they had mounted in in a laboratory i suppose as i'm an american i should say laboratory now um, the one of the hemispheres with its flat side upward on a, a, a steel tower there was a, a wall of beryllium bricks to protect Louis Slotin from any radiation. And he had the other hemisphere on top of it, but separated from it by a screwdriver held vertically like that. And what he was doing, the experiment was called tickling, tickling the dragon's tail. You turn the screwdriver slightly, which lowers the upper hemisphere. And this, as it's lowered towards the lower hemisphere, radiation escapes. And so everyone in the room, including Alvin Graves, who was standing behind him, was measuring what happened. So quieted everyone down, said, are you ready? You have to do this very, very carefully. He turned the screwdriver maybe 10 degrees, uh, which lowered the upper hemisphere by about a millimeter. And immediately all the Geiger counters started chattering away and all the needles went to one end of the scale. And everyone took the measurements and saw what was happening. And then he took it back to vertical, everything stopped, experiment over. Okay, let's try it again. This time we'll turn it to 30 degrees. So 30 degrees, and this lowers the upper hemisphere by, let's say, three millimeters, and the more, much more radiation is, is produced, and the Geiger counters go completely crazy. And then he returns it to normal, everything quietens down, that part of the experiment is over. And then he says he's going to do it and turn it to 45 degrees and gets the two hemispheres really close to each other. So he's in the process of turning it when somebody in the room drops a teacup. And this startles him and he pulls the screwdriver out and the two hemispheres touch and there's an instant flash of what's this vivid blue light, it's called Cherenkov radiation. And the room is flooded with gamma rays. All the things go off the scale, the noise is unbelievable and panic ensues. And he can only do one thing, very courageously, he reaches over the wall and with his right hand he pushes the upper hemisphere onto the floor and the reaction ceases. And he shouts to everyone, stay where you are. And he gets dosimeters, throws them to everyone and to graves behind him, and does a quick calculation of how much dose everybody's got and has a blackboard bought and is writing furiously calculations because time is very much of the essence. And then he says, okay, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay. You, Alvin Graves, you are probably going to die. And I am definitely going to die, and I'm going to die in nine days. And exactly nine days later, he dies with his hand swollen up with terrible edema of acute radiation sickness, one of the first people to die of radiation sickness. 
Alvin Graves, protected largely by Slotin's body, doesn't get a lethal dose of radiation. He gets a horrendous do dose of radiation, and he's in hospital for a year. He's very, very sick. All sorts of transfusions, bone marrow transplants are done. His life is on the line, but he recovers. And a year later, he comes out of hospital, and the only remaining symptom is a bit of a ball patch on his head. But the remarkable thing about Alvin Graves is that from that moment on, his attitude towards radiation has completely changed, because he says, Radiation's no big deal. If you're a man, you can survive radiation. Radiation sickness is a conspiracy put about by weak-minded people. There is no such thing. Everyone can get over radiation sickness, which is, of course, completely flying in the face of logic. It was a lunatic idea. And you would have think the Atomic Energy Commission would have got rid of him instantly. But they didn't. They kept employing him, and he remained on all the big tests including the biggest and worst of them all, which was on March the 1st, 1954, the test of what's called the Castle Bravo explosion, which was the biggest bomb America has ever set off. It was miscalculated for a start. It was supposed to be only 17 megatons. And you've got to remember that the Hiroshima bomb, which killed so many, was 25 kilotons. We're talking about m megatons, so hugely much bigger. They miscalculated. It was actually, when it went off, it was 50 megatons. So there's never been a bigger weapon. And the extraordinary thing about it, uh, uh, and Graves was in charge of it, was that the wind was blowing to the northwest when they were doing the test. And had it continued to blow in the northwest, the plume of radiation would have swept harmlessly over the sea. But 36 hours before the test, the wind backed to the east and started blowing in the direction of two fully inhabited islands called Rongelap and Rongerik, which had four or 500 people on them. And everyone said to Graves, you can't fire this bomb because these people are going to be devastated by radiation. And he said, they're strong people like me. They'll survive it we'll fire that bomb. And everyone, the civilians, the Navy, the Army, the Air Force said, don't do it. But he said, I'm the boss, fire that sucker. Six o'clock in the morning, 1st of March, 1954, this titanic explosion took place. I mean, it's so unimaginably big. The column, 25 miles high. It's no longer called a mushroom cloud, it's called a cauliflower cloud. It was 60 miles across, like a great boiling brain. And it produced a huge plume of radiation which swept eastwards, impelled by these winds, and within half an hour, white particles were dropping down over the people of Rongelap and Rondrick, and they thought, I mean, they had been startled by this flash in the west, which looked like sunrise, except, of course, it was in the west, and by the incredible sound, and now this stuff came, and they thought, this is the snow that we've read about, and they held out their hands to catch it, and they tasted it, and they smelled it, and within an hour, they were sick, staggering about, terrible stomach problems, listless, in bad shape. And what did the Americans do? They said, this is wonderful. This is an experiment. We can see what's happening to these people, people exposed to radiation. Let's just keep them there and watch them. And occasionally they sent people over in bodysuits and things with Geiger counters, but mostly for about four days, they just observed them from, through binoculars from the ships until someone in, in Washington heard of it and said, this is monstrous. These people must be evacuated and sent to a hospital immediately. And ships eventually came, took them off. They took them to an island called Kwajalein, and there they were quarantined. But terrible things happened to them. They were very sick and all sorts of birth defects in the pregnant women and genetic illnesses, and many ultimately died early of leukemia and things like that. A monstrous, monstrous experiment, and all to be blamed on the simple arrogance of this foolish, foolish man, Alvin Graves. Now, I've noticed you sort of circling around. Are you thinking that I ought to stop? Question, soon. Soon. You can do one more. Look, I can do one more. All right, well, I will do one more. Or but not here. Everyone, everyone I'm, you're probably not, but um, I was going to tell you about a man, the, the American who invented North Korea, but I'll leave that for you to find out yourself. But I want to show you, because so much of the book does seem to be miserable, I want to, <laughs> I want to reassure you that it's not. Um, the end papers of this book, I think, are stunning. I mean, that's the sort of typical military scene of uh, it's the 7th uh, Carrier Strike Group, the USS George Washington in the Western Pacific. But this is the image that I like most of all, which is the opening end paper, which is of a boat called the Hokulea. Now, the Hokulea is a 60-foot-long, twin-hulled, 
Hawaiian-built Polynesian, what's called a wa'a, W-A, apostrophe A. And it was built in Hawaii by the Hawaiians as their gift to the American bicentenary. But it wasn't simply the physical thing that they were giving. They were demonstrating that it was still possible for the Polynesians, which of course the Hawaiians are, to navigate craft across vast tracts of the open Pacific without any instruments whatsoever. No compass, no sextant, of course, no GPS or anything like that. The, the skill had been very well known. The Polynesia is a triangle, starting Hawaii in the top, Easter Island in the east, and New Zealand or Aotearoa in the west. And the, and the Polynesians would, save, would sail at will without instruments for thousands of years. But then we Westerners came along and said, you can't sail from Easter Island to New Zealand because this part of the territory is French and this is American and this is German and this is Spanish and this is British. You'll need passports. And they said, well, what the hell's a passport? And then we must fill in an application form. We can't write. We have no need to write. So they gave up, effectively. And, and the skill more or less disappeared. There was one man called Mao Piaoluk, who lived in Satawal. And in 1976, when they built this craft, they went down to see him and said, do you think you can navigate a big canoe, which we're building, um, down to, let's say, Tahiti, two and a half thousand miles south of, uh, of Hawaii? And he said, yes, let's go up and have a look. So he was put on a plane. He'd never been on a plane before, was shown this boat, said it's absolutely wonderful, built to all the traditional designs of Polynesia, and he built a little hammock between the two sailing sweeps at the stern, and they set off. He trained 30 young Hawaiian men and women how to do this using the stars and the patterns of the clouds and the flights of seabirds and the feel of the sea, and he said it'll take exactly six weeks to get two and a half thousand miles to Tahiti. And sure enough, the big pyramid of, uh, which I suppose Ben Carson would think would be used for storing grain, but nonetheless, the big pyramid of, of Papiete was on the southern horizon. They got there in six weeks and they realized they could do this without any instruments, no cheating, no nothing. So they then took the craft up to Japan to remind the Japanese that they were Pacific people too, and then they took it to Vancouver and Haida Gwaii and South America. Well, what they're doing now, and I just think it's the most marvelous thing, Mao Piala died many years ago now, but they know how to do this, to revive the old ways of the Polynesians. And on May the 14th, uh, last year, they left in this craft for the purpose of what's called Malama Hunua, which is worshipping the spirit of the planet by taking this boat without any instruments at all completely around the world. So they sailed it obviously very easily now to um, Tahiti, then they turned right, went to Samoa, went to Tokelau, the Cook Islands, to New Zealand, spent Christmas in New Zealand, went westwards, went round Cape York in Australia, now entering the Indian Ocean, their first out of the Pacific for the first time ever. They beat across the Indian Ocean, went to Christmas Island, went to Mauritius, Two days ago, because they have a website, hokalea.com, hokalea being the Hawaiian word for the star Arcturus, and they reached Mossel Bay in South Africa. And what they're intending to do now is to take it, join the Agullus current, go around South Africa, round Cape Agullus, round Cape of Good Hope, head out into the open Atlantic, their third ocean, head up northwestwards, go to a few places in Brazil, but ultimately head for the Potomac and sail up the Potomac and present themselves to their Hawaiian president to show what they can do. And I just think it'll be wonderful. I, just a great, great moment. And then they'll sail down the east coast of, of South America, go through the Strait of Magellan, nose out just as Magellan himself did back in 1529, hope it is Mare Pacifico for them, nose into the Pacific Ocean and get back home. It'll take the whole journey, it'll take them four years. But what I think will happen, and I hope it happens, is that we in the West who have for so long disdained, disrespected, disapprobated these people, will look at this ability and realize that there are wise people, gentle people who have done great things, and and we will offer them and the ocean on which they sail, something that we've been very short in offering in past years, and that is we'll offer them our respect. There we go. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm, I'm so sorry I, I, I went beyond oh, my allotted time. <laughs> no. So if anyone's got any questions, I'd yeah. be delighted to Just try. raise your hand, I'll bring you the microphone. Hard right, there we are. Oh my. <laughs> Why Edmonton? Why Edmonton? Because a man, oddly enough, called Mr. Cohen, this lady is called Stephanie Cohen, a very um, savvy, 
Jewish Canadian entrepreneur happened to be in Japan and saw these things for sale in Tokyo and said, I can bring them back. I know who will like those. So he started, I mean, it's all, all in here, but uh, yay, Mr. Ken, yay the Coens. <laughs> <laughs> Quite exactly. Any other questions? Is there any rhyme or reason why you think book There's no, no master plan, no, no. Um, no, it really is anything, I mean, I have to persuade him. I mean, I'm in the business at the moment now of persuading him to take the next idea, and he's, he's a little reluctant, so I'm going to have to work on him. I think lunch next week. Well, you, but you, I might get a reaction from you. I could try it out on you. Um, it's, it's, I know there's going to be a, oh my God, what a ridiculous idea, but it's actually not a really, it's the, I want to do the history of precision. And I know precision was a concept invented in 1787 by a man called Henry Maudsley, who made the first perfectly flat piece of steel. And then a man called Jesse Ramsden, who made the first perfect sphere of steel. And Thomas Jefferson, who was in Paris at the time, heard of this and became very interested and realized that this could lead to the creation of what are called machine tools, which are machines that make machines, which we don't generally think about, but are key to everything in industry, and suggested that machine tools be built in the Connecticut River Valley to make, first of all, clocks and then guns. So the Springfield Armory and things like that grew up. And then this led to mass production, it led to Henry Ford and people like that, but it also led led to a lot of extraordinary things. I mean, obviously, there's really precise things like Rolls-Royce and um, Piaget watches and Nikon cameras. And, but there's the fetishization of precision, which interests me, that we've all become so accustomed to smart bombs and iPhones and computers, and we love the precise. But we've forgotten that humankind operates in a natural scale and that we should give as much respect perhaps to things like bamboo and the natural order that are not so necessarily precise. So I, the book will tell a lot of stories of extraordinary people and amazing achievements. I mean, I rode on the train a week ago from um, Washington to uh, New York and met a man who's in charge of most of America's big telescopes, big deep space telescopes. And he said the precision that's being employed in making one particular silver coated mirror, which is being constructed in Palo Alto at the moment, is unbelievable. I mean, the tolerances are millionths of, an, of a centimetre. And this has got to be a thing which you know, is folded up and then springs out of a satellite and becomes sort of half, half a kilometre wide, and yet the tolerances have got to be one ten millionth of a centimetre. So there are all sorts of fascinating stories to tell, at least I find them fascinating. And yet at the same time it asks, uh, as, as a society, are those of us who worship titanium necessarily happier than those who worship bamboo? So I hope he'll accept it, and if so, um, maybe I'll be invited back here in two years, or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, ma'am. Um, you mentioned that the, uh, Marshall, uh, the, the official of Marshall Islands is leading the case for the... Uh, Bikinians, right. Yes, in uh, England. Has the United States taken any, either the government or any organizations taken any responsibility for these people? Well, <laughs> money. Unfortunately, in the whole saga of the Marshall Islands, and it goes well beyond Bikini itself, money plays an, a, an indelicate role. I and mean, if I can give you one example, Kwajalein, which is another atoll about 250 miles southwest of Bikini, is nowadays and has for the last 20 years been the Ronald Reagan Pacific Missile Testing Center. And it's... They fire missiles from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California and Kodiak in Alaska at targets in this very big lagoon. It's about 100 miles long. And there's a big army base and everyone lives, you know, perfectly manicured lawns and air conditioning and it's just lovely for those who are based there, except for the islanders. There were 17,000 islanders who lived on the Ma on, on Kwajalein and they are not allowed to live on the base. They are corralled into one tiny island in, in the atoll called Ebai, which is about as big as a New York City block. So in the middle of this, there is a pullulating slum
of incredibly impoverished, very resentful people with no adequate sewage, no adequate shopping, no adequate schools, all eating spam and coke, and co they're all suffering from type 2 diabetes. Yet these are their islands. I mean, the, the, and the, they have nowhere, for instance, to bury their dead or to wash their clothes. So the, a little ferry will take them to the American base where there's a laundromat, only the laundromat is outside the barbed wire. And so they sit there, they have to pay for the laundromats, of course, and centimeters away from them, through the chain link fence, are people playing golf and you know, having a nice American country club life. But they can't climb over the fence because they'd be in terrible trouble. And yet these are their islands. But, well, no, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but just to say, for that privilege, the American government pays the Marshallese $17 million a year. But the problem is that the system of government within the Marshallese in society, the, the, the kings, the princes, the Iroj, they're called, I-R-I-O-J, they all live in huge mansions in Honolulu and care little for the fate of their people. So there's an enormous amount of corruption which the Americans don't manage or try to eradicate. So Ebay is an example and what's happening to the Bikinians is another. And I hope this book will at least throw a little light on what I think is an utterly shameful situation. It makes me very angry. And there are no private foundations or anything that are getting involved? People do try, yes. But it's it, it, news of, uh, it's, uh, this is well, if we had this discussion in Honolulu today, people would be familiar with it. But we're now 6,000 miles from Honolulu and we've got other things to worry about, you know, Paris and so forth. So their plight is, is it's not a first world problem. Time for one more question. Ma'am. Um, I am fascinated by your, your um, full panoply and, and have been grateful for your writing. And I am always um, struck by how much research you've done. And I wonder, has the onset of the internet and, you know, sped up how quickly you're able to produce these magnum books? Well, yes and no, but I mean, as, as Nancy will well know, I mean, I spend, I don't know, I spend a fortune now here, but I, because I live most of my time up in the country, but I spend such a lot of money on books, because when I get a new subject, like I was in, I don't know if you know, McLeod's book in Vancouver, it's a great, great antiquarian bookstore, and they have so much on old engineering which I have bought, I, I keep ringing my wife and saying, has the package arrived yet? Because once I've got a sort of a, a critical mass of books that I can start reading into, I do. And of course the internet makes life a lot easier. But for, for me, it's, oh, absolutely. Uh, books and scientific papers and, you know, transactions of the Philosophical Society of London, 1850, all those sorts of things. I have great runs of them. And then when I finish doing a book, they all go downstairs in, in my study. I have relatives who've stayed in this study and can attest to this fact. If you go down, it's like geology, because there are, you know, there's the Atlantic, and below that there's the, the man who loved China, and below that. So, you know, when I'm dead, that'll be interesting for someone to, to plow through, like the Jurassic. Terrific. Thank you so much for being Thank here you. tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Really a pleasure. Thank you.